Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the EPA chief faces some tough questions from Congress. Plus, Farm Bill Prep continues. Three members of the Senate Ag Committee take the show on the road. In Southern Gardening, our new segment host, Eddie Smith, says you can have a taste of Italy in your herb container garden. And in our feature, oyster farmers clean up, literally. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. With so much happening with WOTUS, no surprise that Congress is asking tough questions. Recently, EPA Chief Michael Regan found himself on a bit of a hot seat, WOTUS just one of the topics, as he testified before the House Ag Committee. Addressing that and more, Peter Tubbs has the story. EPA Administrator Michael Regan appeared before the House Agriculture Committee. The agency's process for regulating agricultural chemicals and the waters of the United States were popular topics. Particularly when we have a Supreme Court case pending and the administration chose to move through and rush this cumbersome law and costly rule that will ultimately have to be changed. What do you, what do you say to that? Yeah, I say that the courts vacated the, the previous navigable waters, waters rule of the previous administration and it left a, a void that took us back to pre-2015. Uh, there was some litigation risk to the agency for not fully enforcing the Clean Water Act. So we began moving forward to put this rule into place. Uh, I will tell you that we will respect the ruling of the Supreme Court, but we won't be starting from scratch. The Biden administration has allocated tremendous resources allegedly out of a desire to support American agriculture, but EPA's approach to chlorpyrifos flies in the face of that. Is the White House aware of the economic harm caused by EPA's approach? And if so, what is the jurisdiction and how does EPA intend to make producers whole? I think the frustrating part about this is the, the courts were fed up. Uh, that EPA had not moved in a specific way. And so the courts rendered a judgment that set a timeline very stringent and a bar very high that is atypical of any other pesticide that we have to have jurisdiction over. And so we made the decision that we made based on the science, but also based on our legal obligations of the requirement of the Ninth Circuit Court. Given the dialogue today, the tailpipe emission standards, does the American biofuels market uh, industry have a future in EPA policy? It absolutely does. Um, in 2022, I finalized the strongest RVO uh, in, in history. Uh, and in 2023, 2024, and 2025, uh, we're maintaining that trajectory. Why does the EPA wait until the last minute every single summer to issue the waiver? I think that it's not necessarily waiting until the last minute, but I think if you look at prior administrations that have uh, proactively issued those waivers or gone too quickly, the courts have struck them down. So we have some precedents that we have, have to watch out for. There are certain market conditions that must be present in order for EPA to utilize that waiver. And my staff is taking a constant look at when they become present, we can take action. The Farm Bill locomotive still steaming down the tracks as Congress faces the need for yet another spending package right around the corner. With massive losses, nothing new to farmers, a trio of senators from the Senate Ag Committee continued their listening tour. David Miller has that story. Listening sessions focusing on the next Farm Bill continued this week in Ames, Iowa. Three members of the Senate's Agriculture Committee heard from various Iowa farm groups. So it's all about rural America. It's all about a way of life. It's all, all about producing the, the cheapest, safest food supply of any place in the world. The farm bill is only about 14% now about farmers. And so we want to make sure that you're well represented. I'm a co-chair of the Hunger Caucus. I understand how important the nutrition programs are, and we're going to support those. Senator John Bozeman of Arkansas, who is the ranking member of the Senate Agriculture Committee, was invited to Iowa by fellow committee members Chuck Grassley and Joni Ernst. All three are Republicans. Mexico on the GMO corn issue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's our best market in corn, so that's a big thing. 
Many of the issues brought up were specific to a commodity as comments moved down the line for each of the titles under congressional review. I mean, the vaccine bank is really important in the farm bill. Um, what keeps me up at night is African swine fever being a pig producer. And of course, there is no vaccine for that. But for years, we have been um, t asking for money about a vaccine bank for foot and mouth disease. How does agriculture research be respected and funded as other federal research agencies are uh, funded at very high levels in comparison? A third of our soybeans are destined for China. They are the largest market for our soybeans by far. And there is, China buys 60% of the world's globally traded soybeans. So there's no market that really can replace them. According to Bozeman, crop insurance and the ARC and PLC safety nets remain top priorities for producers. The senator also heard calls for conservation funding and pandemic planning. However, trade is the one big issue being brought up at every stop on the tour. It's a great opportunity right now because we do need to diversify from China for all kinds of different reasons. But the other thing too, when you go to Cambodia, when you go to Asia, they want to diversify too. You know, they, they don't want to put all their eggs in that basket. And so it's just a good opportunity right now. And again, I'm not being partisan in this, but I think uh, even our Democrat colleagues would agree that, that we haven't done a good job with trade. Administrations come and go. Uh, we really do have to figure that out. Bees, of course, are important to ag, responsible for pollinating crops all across the nation. But this winter, the bee industry was hit hard, especially in California, a top ag state. Things could be looking up, though. CNN's Brissa Colon has more on just how much buzz the industry can expect. The bee industry working to recover from this year's storms. Cold, wet conditions hindering pollination of various crops. There was a nine day period where the bees could not fly because of the cold and windy and rainy weather. So it required us to feed our bees more. Local commercial beekeeper Gene Brandy has owned apiaries for over 50 years. He transports his bees over six times a year around the country. During the springtime, Brandy brings his bees to the Central Coast to pollinate wildflowers and produce honey. The bees are here on this ranch in Soledad uh, to potentially make, make some honey, perhaps some sage. There is some sage up in the hills here. Following each winter, some of Gene's hives die. And when the spring hits, he has to make up for them by bringing in some queen bees. Normally we get our California queens by the 1st of April and everybody's late this year because of the storms. So we're getting 100 today and we, they come in a box of 100 and they're, they're, they're $28, $29 a piece. So, so each little box of 100, it's almost $3,000 with shipping. The last three years of drought were not good for the honey industry. Even though the honey flow hasn't started yet this year, Brandy says industry is looking forward to a good spring. Rains have actually been a blessing for us in the sense that it's gonna make for a great spring. There's already a lot of wildflowers out and we're looking forward to um, a good crop of, uh, we're hoping, sage honey, buckwheat honey, toy on honey. Sage honey in particular is a premium product that can only be made after there is ample rain. Here on the Central Coast for honey making, beekeepers are so hopeful about this season that they'll be making sage honey for the first time since 2019. Produce such as berries, seeds of plants like lettuce and broccoli require pollination from bees. Honeybees are certainly important for the Salinas Valley in that there's a lot of vegetable seed crops that require bees. Uh, and uh, for the farmers that were not flooded and are able to farm somewhat normally, uh, there will be bees in their fields uh, very soon, if not already. With more loss to bees this winter than ideal, beekeepers are keeping bee health at top priority. On the lighter side, and this is one of my favorite parts of gardening, herbs can play a big role in your meal planning. This week, Eddie Smith says with a little strategy, you too can enjoy a little taste of Italy. Mangia, mangia. <laughs> Herbs are great to use when cooking. Today on Southern Gardening, we are going to select plants to create an Italian chef's herb combination container. Some herbs commonly used in Italian cooking are parsley, basil, and rosemary. Few herbs have such an easily identifiable flavor and aroma as basil. Believe it or not, 
Basil is in the mint family. You will smell Crimson King before you see it. The huge, lightly cupped violet leaves release a spicy clove aroma, and it makes a great thriller plant. Fabulous for cooking in fresh dishes, Crimson King is a generous producer with good branching on plants that reach 18 inches high and about a foot wide. Huntington Carpet Rosemary is the thriller plant in the container. It forms a beautiful cascading dense blanket of green, gray-green needle-like leaves that are potently fragrant from afar and used as a culinary seasoning. Plain Italian parsley is used as the filler plant in this combination container and is a great cut and come again variety that you will appreciate all season long. The large, flat leaves mince easily and can be snipped in seconds. It is favored for its deep flavor, which some say hold up better in cooking than curly parsley. Choose herbs to create a combination planter that will provide fresh ingredients for your Italian dishes. I'm Eddie Smith, and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break, but stick around. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, a feel-good aquaculture story. Near Connecticut, a dense area, Long Island Sound. Oysters are popular, but over time, water quality declined, then came COVID. The market disappeared. To stay in business, the industry used the time and partnered with Extension to restore oyster beds and keep the fishing industry alive for future generations. Oyster farmers clean up. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believed that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through extension education. We care about their success and yours. Taking care of what matters, MSU Extension. Time for the market report. Prices taking a dive. Not unusual, but this time we had some interesting factors in play that made it happen, and we'll get into it. But first, the numbers. Moving downward, we'll take a look at last week's biggest gains and losses. And then we'll give an update on planting season. And finally, a panel of experts talk about the big issues of what's going on in the ag markets. All right, we've got a slightly abbreviated market report today, so let's get into the numbers. Last week's biggest loss, lumber down $36.5, but the bigger story is corn and wheat down 31 cents and 39 and a half cents respectively. The reasons we'll get into shortly. Last week's biggest gain, lean hogs up about five and a half cents, which is a 6.51% increase so this year we're planning late, but just how late? The USDA recently released its crop progress report and here's what it said. 
In the 18 highest acreage states for corn, 14 percent planted so far. This time last year was only 7 percent. In the 18 highest acreage states for soybeans, 9 percent planted so far. This time last year it was only 3 percent. In the 15 highest acreage states for cotton, 12 percent planted so far. This time last year was the same at 12 percent. In the six highest acreage states for rice, 51 percent planted so far. This time last year it was only 25 percent. So, as you can see, we're not as behind as we thought. However, that's not what the experts are talking about right now. Analysts Don Rose and Ted Seifred say global supply running the show right now, and producers should pay attention. I think if you look at it, it's been for a long time, it's been all about Russia, uh, record crop selling wheat. And we always say for every action, there's an overreaction. We had $13 wheat, and everybody wanted in. I mean, it's Russia, uh, EU, uh, Australia, so I think the bottom line is we just have too much wheat in the world. Good news to end the week, uh, soft red winter wheat at the Gulf's about 30 cents uh, cheaper than uh, the rest of the world, EU and uh, Russia. So uh, looks like maybe the market's finding some support down here. And I think what's going to happen this summer is you're going to see a lot of volatility because you're going to have a lot of uh, short bought people that want in the market. Don't lose fact there was no deliveries on uh, corn, soybeans, big deliveries on wheat. You buy uh, big deliveries and that's what happened. And by the way, uh, July corn 610 calls were going for about 11 cents there early in the day on Friday. Uh, I think they settled up uh, a little over 12. But in six dollars at 12. In 50 uh, six, six, six dollar calls were 12. Okay, right. right yes. Yeah, so right yeah. in that neighborhood. And that's 56 days of potential upside at the time of year where you would expect to see that. Now, the, the strange thing about corn is that we had this big drop in the middle of last month. And then we came back based on a quarterly grain stocks number that was supposedly bullish, although it didn't translate into a tighter balance sheet. And now we're doing it again. The worry that I have is that all of us expect for corn to rally into the beginning part of the growing season as we normally do because of weather premium. But we've already had the break, the recovery, and now this break again. So this may be, we might not get that. I hope we do. The only thing that is really giving me a problem with this big slide that we just had is the time of the year, the calendar, right? This isn't the right time to be doing this necessarily. But we're also at these higher prices. You know, normally when we rally into a weather premium, we're doing it from, you know, $4, $3.80. We're already at some very elevated prices that we've been at for years, and demand destruction happens, and you get Brazil with the second season corn crop looking very good. With the Chinese cancellations, you have to wonder what they're doing, because if this grain corridor deal is going to fall apart, if Russia pulls out of that, that means that a lot of corn coming, going from the, uh, Ukraine to China disappears. So does China know something? Are they going to push Russia to continue to, to, to be part of the grain corridor? Or is China saying that they have enough booked between now and that second season corn crop, which is looking very good, and a lot of the, the, the Brazilians are raising their estimates on that second season corn crop, even though it was planted late and into a, a, a risk area of hot and dry, that hot and dry hasn't occurred, that crop looks good. So why is China canceling and will they cancel more? That's the big question the market has. What's the real value of corn? And I think if you look at it, in August of 2020, uh, we had a low in corn of uh, 307. Mm -hmm. Then in May of uh, 22, we had a high of 827. So from a producer standpoint, you're sitting here just over five, five and a quarter on D's corn. Um, you know, what am I going to do with it? Where do I go from here with insurance at 591? You're 60 cents under insurance on corn. Pr producers aren't going to sell um, 90 on soybeans. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Planting season well underway and global markets making big moves. Never gets dull around here. Mike? Thanks, Zach. Never dull indeed. Long Island Sound is in one of the most populated areas of the country. According to the GAO, low water quality over the years has made it harder for fish and other species to survive. Since the 70s, many have worked to clean up the water and keep aquaculture alive. John Torpy has more. Submerged in brackish waters along the Connecticut coastline, newly nested oyster beds are helping restore the environment and protect generations of family tradition in New England aquaculture. Connecticut was the cream of the crop, pun intended, for, for oysters, you know, and that we want to see that come back. Around the turn of the 20th century, 
oysters became a popular dietary staple for New Englanders. In Connecticut, demand for oysters was particularly high because of the nutrient-rich environments of the natural oyster beds. So what's really unique in Connecticut are these large tracts of oyster beds that are in intertidal areas like this, but also in deep water areas. According to the Connecticut Department of Agriculture, the steep rise in popularity for oysters led to depletion of the natural beds due to overfishing. To keep up with strong demand, oystermen began cultivating oysters and oyster seed to raise their own stocks. As the decades progressed, so did cities and towns. Expanding communities and agriculture took a toll on the water aquaculture farmers depended on for raising shellfish. Many places, the oyster beds have really been decimated early on by overfishing, but later by development. Here in Connecticut, we've faced all of those impacts early on, but these oyster beds are large and they have been sustained by industry and protected by regulators through the years. Tessa Getches is an aquaculture extension specialist with the University of Connecticut Sea Grant Program. Getches works with the fishing industry and seaside communities to help establish and strengthen support for the shellfish industry while improving the environment where fishermen work. Even with local oversight and industry regulation, yields from oyster harvests have been on a steady decline, according to the Connecticut Bureau of Aquaculture. Layers of silt have covered the existing cultch, prohibiting oyster larvae from setting on shells and continuing to grow into adulthood. Getchus and other colleagues established a pilot program to encourage restoration of the oyster beds as a way to clean up the environment and, at the same time, protect a way of life. So when we started, it was just ahead of COVID, and we wanted to bring people together to talk about what is the future of the Connecticut oyster industry and also these natural habitats. When restaurants shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, oyster farmers were stranded without markets or consumers. At the same time, Getchus needed boots on the ground, or more precisely, boots in the boats, to help launch the restoration plans for Connecticut oyster habitats. With boats and businesses idle, boat captains were recruited to help get rid of the silt choking the Connecticut shellfish industry. They couldn't sell their oysters, and we were trying to come with, up with a plan to keep them in business and we had these beautiful beds that needed to be restored and this fleet that was just ready to work. And so we really didn't have to convince them to, to get out and help us with this. They knew it was important. It's, it's their insurance, really. These gaps right here, that allows the shell to pass through the dredge and we keep the shell on the bottom. Okay, yeah. This will hold the oysters in it. So we're eliminating, keeping the shell on the bottom, but we're taking the oysters up. But any other shell that the guys have that's on the bench, they're putting right back down. Robert Noholm is owner of Bell Shellfish and is part of the seven generations of his family who have spent their lives harvesting clams and oysters off the coast of Connecticut. So one, I love to tell this to everyone, one full grown oyster will filter 50 gallons of water a day. Now multiply that by how many oysters are on the bottom. So the more we cultivate, the more oysters that can be produced, we'll filter more water. That's gonna increase the water quality in Long Island Sound. This stuff we love to keep, we'll hold it and then we'll plant it on our setting grounds. This stuff is, is perfect for what we need clamshell to, clamshell for. Norholm is an early adopter of the shellfish restoration program. Acknowledging benefits to the oysters, and the future of his business. So the process, you know, and how, how we work is we're doing it in a way where we're not gouging the bottom or harming the bottom. We're just scraping along the top. And that's gonna be enough to remove the silt. Once we get the oysters there, it's going to, it's going to help the industry in a long way because they have an area where they can go grab, catch oysters to plant on their own grounds and put into the market. So small in, the small industry guys that are able to do it, they're gonna benefit from it years from now. 
Norholm's passion for shell fishing has deep roots. He relies on a long established family history and personal experience, helping to keep the industry alive for future generations because my grandfather is still my teacher and he is still going to teach me to, until he decides to retire, which I don't see coming anytime soon. His idea was is to get this natural bed cleaned up, get it cultivated and the silt removed and that way we, more oysters can grow because that's what he wants to see. Great story. Well, next week, speaking of conservation, a very special story about what many call a natural beauty. It's the Crosby Arboretum in Picayune, a living memorial showcasing ecosystems across the landscape, an art form all by itself. Come with us to Picayune, Mississippi. It's a trip you won't soon forget. Another example of just how extension matters. The Crosby Arboretum, next time on Farm Week. Before we go, police in Niles, Illinois, had a cow or an unusual situation near a school a few days ago. They got a call about people running through a neighborhood along with a steer on the loose. Officers responded and with help from a farmer, they corralled the cow and got it into a trailer. It was taken to a local humane society. Turns out the whole thing was a senior prank gone wrong. Students had bought the animal and were trying to take it to school when it got away from them. Nobody was hurt. The students involved were issued tickets. The school says it won't pursue criminal charges. <laughs> Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next week. Thanks for watching.